So here I am, 29 years later, in Edmonton, <laughs> talking about a show that I did 29 years ago. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, I, 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 they must have liked what I was doing. And I mean, I know they liked what I was doing. And, and you know, that was my entry. I, from that, I've had many, many, many wonderful things take place. And I've also lost out on some things where people will say, and when people come up to me even now, you know, uh, you know, the, the, let's say the people who uh, who watch Days of Our Lives. I had somebody say this to me today. I saw you on Days. That's where I was first introduced to you. I said, oh, okay, great. And then I saw you as Q. I really didn't buy you as Q. I really thought that you were like on Days of Our Lives. <laughs> you mean I was like Days of Our Lives in space now, right? <laughs> but that's what happens. That's just what happens. And especially in the US, and I think pretty much in Canada as well, as a, and I say this as opposed to in England, um, they, we have so many actors that it, it tends to be, you get used up. So, um, that's what happened. Uh, 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 I am sure, I, actually I know that I would not have been on Breaking Bad if they had recognized me as, as uh, <laughs> Because they, they, they brought me on Breaking Bad. I mean, I did an audition for it. None of those people had ever seen a Star Trek show. And they were really happy with what I did. And then, at a couple of meetings, people would come up and go, oh man, I really love you. You know, the writers there and the producers, oh really, but they're talking to me, really love you on, on, the, on Breaking Bad. And man, on Star Trek, you know, like that. And they'd look at me and go, were you on Star Trek? <laughs> so, thankfully, they have not seen me. Okay. Right here. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. Um, I'm really glad to go to the Britain Bad point because everybody loves the cue and how you've said yourself, you're kind of the imp and the happy person. But your Breaking Bad performance, which I just saw on season three, don't spoil anything, please, I'm just still going through it. Um, <laughs> your performance as the father character to the uh, uh, recovering addict was so powerful and so strong. It, it, was, it was like watching, sorry to say, a naked version of you trying to get through the scenes. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, how and where do you go in your mind, in your process, to pull out something so dark, but something you want to help so badly? Just how do you go there as the actor? What kind of is in your mind to pull out that kind of performance? Well, um, first of all, thank you. And secondly, you cannot do that unless the material is there. It's very difficult to elevate yourself above the material. As I, um, uh, as a actors, we use this phrase all the time, turning shit into Shinola. You know, um, uh, but Shinola is just like, you know, over here, you know, look over here so you don't really see what's going on over here. Um, but that isn't what, uh, you, you don't get very far up the chain, as it were. Um, uh, mostly, I mean, I'll answer this as, a, as an acting thing. Mostly is, is that if you have material like that, in an environment like that, for those of you who don't know, and this will not take away from the show, and that is, is that, I mean, you all know that this is a show about essentially a, a, a man who... A, let's say at the beginning at least, a good man, you know, <laughs> who makes a series of bad judgments and then continues to <laughs> make those bad judgments. Um, I, when I looked at it, I, you, have to make an, you have to make an analysis. In the same way that I did with Days of Our Lives, I looked at it, I looked at it and I went, you know, what they want is a psycho, what they need is a comedian. Well, I looked at the show, and there were only a few episodes out, I think about six episodes at the time, and I've, obviously I read the material, uh, my own material, and I looked at it and I went, I am a true victim here. This is what I am. Um, and by being a true victim, I am oblivious to all of the 
of the um, undercurrents of what's going on. I have only one interest, and that is to save my daughter. Well, at that point, it, I just substitute, I have two boys. I just substitute that. And then the, perhaps the next most important thing is, and this is as an actor, and it took me a long time to learn this, you then have to get out of your own way. You just have to get out of the way. So um, you let it just go through you. You say the words, but mostly, you know, really good acting is a gestalt. You hit here, 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 and here. And the audience fills in this part. Okay? With their own personal uh, stuff, you know. So uh, otherwise it becomes a caricature. So, okay. Next. <laughs> yes. Pipe up. Where are you? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, what was your favorite part um, for being Discord? What was my favorite character for what? Um, what was your favorite part for being Discord? What was my favorite part of being Discord? Um, uh, uh, do you know about Discord? <laughs> Okay, so not that many of you. <laughs> Let me sit down. Uh, I got a call uh, uh, from my agent saying, uh, you have an offer to do my... Uh, this is my voiceover agent. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I asked three questions which is the three questions, which actually is probably applies to any one of you, a, a, a version of these three questions. Uh, what's the material? I need to see the material. When and how much? <laughs> Those are the three essential questions. Uh, and I didn't, you know, he said the name of the thing. It didn't make any, you know, I, I didn't know. Talking about, and I said, send me the material. Uh, they need an answer right away. I said, fine, I'll, I'll read it right away. And I, I read maybe four pages. I mean, they, they emailed it to me. I read about four pages. I went, this is fine. It's a kids' show. I mean, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not pouring gasoline on something. <laughs> you know, so yeah, sure, great. I like that. I I prepped the material the night before, which means about an hour and a half to two hours of prepping and because I am dyslexic I have to make sure that I circle you know make my eyes are not floating all over the place I go in the next day I'm by myself in, in, a, in a recording room studio there's a guy on the other side of the glass and then they that's patched into a, a group of people uh, in, uh, in in this case uh, uh, Vancouver and an hour or you know an hour and 15 minutes later done never to be thought of again <laughs> a, three months later i go down to my computer and uh i open up my my email and there are about three or four hundred emails <laughs> i'm like oh christ i've been spammed <laughs> Oh my God! And you know, and I, I this is my email, and I don't want to get rid of this email address. Oh, I got, and I begin reading it. M L P. And I go, what the hell does that mean? And then my little pony. I call up to my wife. What do you know about my little pony? <laughs> and she says, Well, <clears throat> it's a, it's a, a, a voiceover. That you months ago, and it's a cartoon for little girls. I said, well, let me tell you something. These are not little girls that are like <laughs> And that was my introduction into the world of My Little Pony and Bronies. <laughs> and a friend of mine came over that night and, you know, for dinner, we were telling him this story, and he goes, oh, let's do a documentary. I went, are you kidding? I am not touching this with a 10-foot pole. 
And then I came up to Vancouver to shoot something, and some kids came up to me, 20-year-old guys. And they said, could you sign up for them? And I go, for my little pony? <laughs> uh, okay. You know, three or four of them. And then, uh, then the next night, uh, because I would eat in this particular restaurant, and they go, I, I go, why are you watching this show? Well, because we love the stories, we love the, um, uh, you know, the colors, we love the music of the show. I went, oh, okay, okay. And as time went on, I was there for about 10 days, as time went on, I began getting a very interesting picture in my mind of who these guys were. And there were, every once in a while, there was a girl in there. And... <laughs> Um, but they were not necessarily the, they, they were certainly not the captain of the football team or the, or the prom queen or something like that. And uh, I uh, had, uh, uh, Leonard Nimoy and I had a company, I, I created a company and Leonard and I were partners in it, called Alien Voices. And so I would be able to talk to Leonard quite a bit about just the beginning, what was the beginning of knowing when Star Trek was something. What was that beginning? You know, not that, yeah, oh yeah, it's a really nice show, but when it was something else. So, and I began going, oh, I feel like I'm at the beginning of something else here. And my friend who had not forgotten about, let's do a documentary, and knowing how I feel politically about Fox News, um, uh, uh, um, said, I think you should take a look at this. And it was, um, a, uh, a series of, of, of you know, clips on, which essentially paraphrased or, or along the lines of, you know, bronies, the latest degradation in our culture, are a bunch of homosexuals who live at home on food stamps and disability. And I went, you know, that's really wrong. First of all, it's, it's wrong to say in, in, anyway, but it's wrong because I know, I've, I've met 20 or 30. So I called up my friend and I said, okay, you got me, we're gonna make this documentary. Because um, these people need some cover, some, some uh, before they, they are, uh, they're so, you know, have we really gotten to the point that, that I understand um, that it, it was a show made for 10 year olds. But it's a show about being kind and honest and loyal and, you know, all these good things. And does it really make a difference that 20-year-olds are watching it? Does that change everything? Have we really gotten to that point? So that's why we made this documentary, which, which uh, well, up until just recently was on Netflix. And I think it's going to somewhere else that you can see it. Okay, sorry I got boo. Five minutes. Until... <laughs> Until... Yes. Until the photon troop Okay, stuff. all right. Okay, next. Go on. Hello. Hello. Um, okay. Um, I, you mentioned earlier... I'm in the back corner over here. Where are you? On this side. <laughs> Hi. Oh, okay, there you go. How's it going? Um, you mentioned earlier about how you grew up in a household without television and you were diagnosed with dyslexia, A, also high. Um, what sorts of things did you do as you were growing up for entertainment and how has that carried out into your adult life? What sorts of things do you get inspiration from? Where do you seek out creativity? Well, I, I, I used to, up until actually quite uh, recently, I used to, I'm, I'm known amongst my friends as the one who comes up with a lot of projects. I, I, I self-motivate. I, I decided early on that being in a state of creativity was the um, state in which I most enjoyed being alive. So, um, uh, for which this is this is a, 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 a version of it. So I would try to do anything. I, I was willing to do all sorts of things 
that, that would continue to do that. So I, I wrote and I produced and I acted and I directed. Um, and and uh, so that's, that's what I did. Uh, in terms of growing up in a household without um, television, you know, the deal was is I was supposed to be reading. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I also was somebody who would be sent up to my room to do a, a homework, you know. So, you know, five arithmetic problems was essentially five hours. And the reading of a chapter of a book could be a lifetime. I, I, I you know, I just wasn't connecting with much of anything. So, uh, so I spent a lot of time in my room, uh, perhaps imagining um, uh, my introduction into reading actually came, oh, I, 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 I was asked to, um, to give a, a very prestigious award. And I, I think they just simply ha asked me because, you know, oh, we need to have a celebrity give this award, which it, I always find to be unfortunate. Uh, but it was, uh, it was for poetry. And it was the largest prize in the world, I think, which was a hundred and 13, I love that. It's like, it could be just $100,000, but it was $113,000. And, um, and they asked me to do it. Well, I took it very seriously and, and delivered a speech uh, that was a very successful speech um, because my introduction to reading was through poetry. I used to be the janitor. There were three of us at school who were the janitors. And I also had this endless detention. It started in the, I think, fifth grade, and it just went on. <laughs> and, um, and so I was there after school for two hours every day, and rather than just sit around, I helped the janitor, and then I would come in on Saturdays. Well, I, was, I cleaned the school. I also, interestingly enough, psychologically interesting, not only did I clean the school and clean the library, but I cleaned out the library, which means that I would steal books and take them home. With them. <laughs> books like Locke's treatise on government, you know, or James Joyce, you know. Every 12-year-old needs a collection of James Joyce. Uh, <laughs> And I would put them up in my room. And one of the books in which I took was this book called The Golden Treasury of Poetry. And, you know, I would look at these books and, I, and, and what I would see on the page, which is to this day, I would see just like, like a mass. But when, and I go, oh, and that would you know, get put on the shelf. But when I opened the poetry book, they were in little manageable bites that my eye could follow. And so I would read those and then read them over and over again because poetry is great about that. And then become, actually start learning them. And um, because I didn't know how to spell, my teacher, his idea of, t of teaching me how to spell was to have me stand under one goal post <laughs> And he would stand under the other goalpost and he would scream out words to me. And I would call back. First, first, spell first. F, F, I, F, R, I, S, T. No! Actually, I still don't even know how to spell. Uh, <laughs> F, I, R, F, R, I, no, like that. But I think through that I developed a voice, actually. So I just found ways of compensating. No. All right, are we, okay, one last question, one last question, okay, uh, one last question, quick, oh uh, yeah. Hello, I just have uh, two questions for you. Oh. <laughs> well, there are quick questions here. I believe the next generation gets together once a year, I'm just wondering if you're included in that, and the second question. No. <laughs> They, they do get together once a year. I didn't know that. Uh, we get together all the time. We go to conventions together. <laughs> Too much. 
<laughs> yeah, okay, quick. The other question was, uh, was Q ever, was there ever a script for Q in the movies, in the next generation? No, I, you know what, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I didn't make it into the movies. Uh, I, I, I don't know. That's sort of a downer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question, as I'm leaving, one more quick. A national embarrassment. Oh. A national embarrassment. And the thing is this, is that the people who will vote for him will be fleeced yet again. Because they are, they have, the, the, the critical thinking has gone out the window. And, uh, and, and here it is. Um, now I'm depressed. <laughs> Thanks a lot.